You're listening to the Coop Homeschool Podcast. This is your podcast for community, humility, and joyful fun in homeschooling. I'm Mandy. I'm Jessica. And this is The The Coop. Coop. Today, we're talking about teaching history. Yes. So why teach history and what major principles do we need to know in homeschooling history? How do we educate our children for knowing history in preparation for college? So we sit down with a historian, my husband, um, to learn um, some fundamentals about a history education. Yes. But first, our scoop on the coop. Um, I'll go. Okay. So it's time for my annual last week of summer road trip. Ooh. Last year we did a big three-week road trip that was pretty epic. And this year we're doing just one week. We weren't going to do one, and then at the last minute decided we got to get one in. Yeah. And I thought it was a great end cap to last year's study of California. Oh, perfect. And so we're going to go up to Big Sur, camp um, in the coastal mountains, go to Monterey Bay Aquarium. Oh, yeah. We're getting a lot of like, yeah, yeah, we're getting a lot of geology and habitats, ecologies, and that stuff in as well as. Some last of the history in areas. Um, we did a lot of talking about sea otters. Oh. So we'll be in their natural habitat as well. And then after Monterey, Monterey Bay, we're going to go up to Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park, which is where I grew up camping. So it's a really neat thing to be able to take both of my kids I and my that. husband at the same time. I've gone with my husband He's never once. been? Oh, okay. All we right. went before we got married and went camping okay. there, okay. and that was How really fun. awesome. Yeah. And then I took my daughter when she was only one and a half. Because my parents and sister oh, wanted to fun. do a trip, and my husband couldn't go. So yeah, that's I, t- awesome. I took her, and she and I camped in our own little tent, just the two oh, of us. Oh, that's so... It was super cute. Yeah, it's so, so I have bonding. great pictures of it. Right, but she was one and a half and has no memory of it whatsoever. But I have great pictures. I love it. And um, now I get to take my whole family. Aww. And so I'm really looking forward to it. My mother-in-law is going to come with us again. Oh, yeah, and I'm awesome. super excited. And you're camping in Big Sur as well. Correct. So okay. we'll do um, three nights camping in Big Sur, a night in a hotel in that Monterey, nice. yeah. and then three nights camping in Sequoia in the National yeah. Park. And yeah. That's yeah, awesome. I'm really looking forward to it, gathering all my resources, which I'm sure I'll share with you guys at some point. Yeah. That's awesome. That's yeah. going to be so much fun. So I can't excited. wait to see pictures. So my scoop is I just a couple days ago worked for probably three to four hours trying to combine all my history curriculum. So I have Story of the World, Tapestry of Grace, and Gather Around Ancient Civilizations Unit Study, which I'm treating like a whole year study. Right. Those are my most um, comprehensive. Then I have the ancient history and then I have the history of science in Mm -hmm. the ancient times. And I was trying to figure out how to combine all them, plus all the history books Mm -hmm. and the stories of Gilgamesh and, you know, all that stuff. And what I found was after tearing over Mesopotamia and Egypt, which I didn't even know were two different locations. Oh. (laughs) So So you've been learning a lot. I was learning. I was like, wait, I thought Egypt... It was just post Mesopotamia. I had no idea that they were like totally other. I, I had no geography, nothing. So take this as encouragement to all of you. Oh my goodness. So I had to learn all that. And then um, one of the curriculums put Egypt first, and one of the hmm. curriculums put Mesopotamia first. And so then I was like trying to combine them, but then it's like, well, then I have to skip this. And then Gilgamesh is in chapter nine of Story of the World, but is in like the first lesson or so of Gather Around Ancient Civilization. So it was just like, I can't. I I figured out, and my husband was like, hey, at least you figured it out. Right. Like, it, you yeah. were going to have to do this. I was like, I feel like I just wasted three hours no. trying to combine all these yeah. things, and I couldn't do it. Right. I'm like looking up YouTubes. I'm looking up timelines i'm trying to figure out wait because they also aren't putting dates like gather around and story of the world didn't have actual dates so i couldn't even see where it fit on the timeline right and i and and i didn't even open tapestry of grace because i was like oh i can't add another into the mix so i decided i'm just going to go with gather around ancient civilizations because i love the way she teaches the script is there she has all the activities i have the student workbooks the art is beautiful and then Story of the World is just going to be like, oh, we've gotten this far. Let's put it in the car when we're driving to robotics. 
right. and we'll listen up until then. And it'll be like our review. Yeah. And then now I can start to put all the other things in. Yep. So thank goodness I decided to do a week of creation to start off. Or otherwise right. I would have been scrambling. Yes. I know this pain, Mandy. <clears throat> I yes. know this pain. I know. <laughs> I know. You did it with California. Yep. And I'm still working through it on my U.S. study. Because I decided to zoom out into North America first. Yeah, so. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Still working it out. Yeah. And... The thing is, I wish I could just be like, hey, I'm doing this one curriculum, but I find value no. yeah. in so many of these other perspectives and these other focuses yeah. that I want to use them all. And to preface the upcoming interview, yeah, it, it just reinforces that. Yes. Hearing what your husband had to say reinforces that because there's no one correct approach. Right. Per se. Yeah. There's no one way to be comprehensive in your study of a certain topic, time, or era. Right. And so using multiple sources is helpful in helping you figure out what you're missing from one. If yeah. they're cookie cutter and the same, then maybe you're not doing a, a good job finding well-rounded right. yeah. sources. So I find that no one I feel can be done on its own or that I feel compelled to do on its yeah. own. Yeah. Well, and um, our mutual friend just gave me nine boxes yeah. of History Unboxed. And it's like Uruk and the Pharaohs and um, Yaman and Ancient Australia. So now yeah. I have these to figure out where they go. And they have their own yeah. booklets of curriculum mm -hmm. and activities. So I'm super excited about that because now I actually have the craft in hand and the yeah. supplies or whatever right. it is It's we're just doing. more supplement, which is great. Yeah. Supplement is, is what you want to add in. It's but it's hard easier. to have two curriculums and find a way to... Yeah, the, to the two comprehensives yeah. or three, you, you just can't do. No. Yeah. I just got something from Berean Builders, which is where I got my science book they have like a cheat sheet for all the major story of the world they list all these major history homeschool curriculums and how to merge the timelines so now i'm like whoa it merges now with story of the world what about gather round it's not right. on there and right. i wish they had one for that because now i'm like all right well i can see where it goes with story of the world and then maybe try right. and merge that i don't know <laughs> i don't know all I know is there's going to be crafts. I just ordered from History Unboxed, the Ancient Eats oh, nice. book. So I'll pass that along to you when, yeah, you, when awesome. you start. And so I know we're going to do recipes. I know I'm going to do the boxes. I know I have tons of books and I have a timeline for them to fill out. So it's going to be awesome and it fun. Is. Yeah. All right. So now let's talk about, I'm going to introduce, even though Marcus is my husband and that's good enough. No, but I'm going to introduce who he is. He's Dr. Marcus MacArthur. He's a homeschool dad, college professor in American history, Western civilization, and American military history. He's a seminary professor in church history and graduate research and writing, and has authored numerous K-12 supplemental educational resources about history. He has a BA from UCLA in sociology, a master's in church history and theology, and a doctorate in American history. Along with his decades of experience, he brings a wealth of expertise to us today in the realm of history education. So let's tune in to that interview now. All right, well, we're so excited to have you on today. Long time, big time. Yeah. First time and big time. Sure. Well, it wasn't your first time. You were on you That's true. I was on before, yeah. With uh, Jessica's yeah. husband. But yeah. now you're solo. Are we supposed to talk in like NPR voices? Yes, um, we're supposed to be very okay. calm very and serious. professional. Okay. So, um, since we have an in-house expert, we thought we would just dive right in Great. and ask you, from your point of view, the why. Why teach history? What are the benefits of teaching history? Well, there are so many. Uh, I'll talk about a few of them that come to mind. The first thing I think is just a very fundamental one is uh, it helps to explain why things are the way they are. And that's the reason that I got into history in college, um, I first got interested in to theology and I had a lot of questions. Why, why are things the way they are in the, the Christian landscape today? Why do we have a Catholic church and a Protestant church? I knew some of it, but it didn't, still didn't make sense. Why in Protestant churches are there all these denominations? Why do some of them worship and believe different things in so many different ways? And so I read a, a general survey of history of Christianity in the United States and Canada, and 
it just so many things clicked for me and provided that context and explained at least part of the story for why things are the way they are. And so I think that's one of the just the most fundamental benefits of studying history. And it applies, obviously, to, to pretty much any aspect in, of life. And, and you think of questions that your kids ask you about almost anything. I mean, um, you know, they can ask, why, why do we have a president instead mm -hmm. of a king or why um, for education? Why, why do most of my other friends, why do most people go to a school um, and we're at home? Well, it's hard to give sufficient answers to a lot of questions without mm. getting into some history. Yeah. So it just helps explain why things are the way they are. Another really important benefit, I think, is it helps to develop critical thinking skills. And it's not the only discipline that develops critical thinking skills by any means, but but I do think history does a really good job of that. And you know, when you do history, you're required to analyze sources or evidence, um, as you would in science. And you're supposed you you would need to analyze um, why this source and not this source. What part of this source is relevant to my research question? Mm -hmm. You have to evaluate historical arguments and claims. Uh, is the is the the evidence uh, that this historian is presenting, does it support their argument? Is it the right kind of evidence? Is it sufficient amount of evidence? Is it representative uh, of the, the sources, um, as far as you can tell? And you're just evaluating arguments, so you're developing those critical thinking skills. And obviously this is something, it's helpful if you become a historian, but for anything, just to be an informed citizen. I mean, we don't have to go back very far, I mean, through the the last couple of years, um, there are so many claims on TV and in the political realm or social media uh, where, uh, you know, these comp competing arguments, uh, it's really helpful to have those critical thinking skills. In fact, just today, not to get political, but um, <laughs> I, no, I know I'm not, but uh, there was a report that just came out showing that I believe it was nine year olds over the last two and a half years since the pandemic pandemic started their math and reading skills declined dramatically, which is frightening because American uh, reading skills was already uh, pretty scary. And so the question was asked in a briefing to the, uh, the White House press secretary, you know, related to the, the report connected it to the closure of schools during the pandemic. And the press sec secretary said, well, it was actually under the Republican administration that the schools closed and it's actually been in this Democratic uh, administration, presidential administration under Biden, that the schools have been reopening. Hmm. And that's actually true. Right. But of course, that if, and it's an historical claim, right. very recent history, but it's yeah. a historical claim. Yep. So if you have, it doesn't take a whole lot of critical thinking skills on this one, but you know, you have to look at the context of that, obviously, right. um, in the very early part of the pandemic, a lot of people didn't know what we were dealing with. Um, and then but the most important thing, and then obviously the pandemic started to go away uh, under Biden's administration. So there's that context. But then also the states were, mm -hmm. it was the state governors who were the ones making those decisions. And it tended to be the Democratic state governors that were closing the schools. And yes. it tended to be more so the Republican uh, state governors who were keeping schools open or reopening them earlier. So whatever, however you believe about that politically, that context shows that that was a silly argument to make. Now, she, what she should have said, if she was being historically honest, was um, she should have said, well, it's true, but the Democrats believe that saving lives is more important than kids being in a classroom together. Right. And obviously that wouldn't satisfy everyone because people no. would disagree with that too um, on the other side. But at least it'd be more historically honest. Uh, so just a, an example that I saw today of how those critical thinking skills are important just to be an informed citizen. I think it's also important uh, learning history because it helps to develop empathy. Mm. So if sympathy is, um, you know, seeing someone's perspective, well, seeing someone's situation and evaluating it from your own perspective, empathy is the ability to put yourself in another person's shoes and assess their situation and well there's no way to do that if you don't have an understanding of that person of that group of that culture and so history helps to give that understanding because we understand 
their history and their right. context and well, their situation. Not to interrupt, but yeah. one of my uh, my favorite classes in college, the the history classes that I took, and you know, liberal arts, you get a whole bunch of history classes. The Jews in the Third Reich, for example, every week we read a narrative, and it was someone who lived through it. And I've mentioned this before because it was so impactful to me to read about from survivors, to read these primary sources, and uh, but especially the the Corey Ten Boon and the um, uh, the book called uh, All But My Life. By but it really impacted me, and I and I felt like I really understood so much more of what happened because I read their story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's one thing to read uh, about what someone else right. telling their story, which does have a, a place for sure and, and, and great impact and it can, but when you're hearing it from the actual source, what is, historians would call primary sources, it makes an even greater impact. I mean, it's one thing to read a book about the history of slavery yeah. that is just strictly narrative with no uh, quotes of primary sources. It's quite another thing to read Harriet Jacobs' incidents in, in the life of, life of a slave girl, yeah. telling her own story as a slave, um, or or Frederick Douglass's "What is the Fourth of July?" Uh, what to the slave is the Fourth of July? Mm -hmm. To hear it from their own voices, from the primary sources. Mm -hmm. Uh, makes a huge difference in understanding their perspective and again developing that that empathy which yeah. you know, some people are born with more or less uh, uh, inclination toward empathy but I think it's a learned skill as well yeah and it's something I think in our culture today that is frighteningly lacking and lack of empathy I think increasingly leads to an us versus them mentality yeah and so because you're not seeing anything from the other person's actual perspective in their shoes as, as much as you can obviously you can never fully get but we all shoes. feel but we do feel victimized we do feel like victims when people don't see it from our point of view right like you have no yeah. idea but it's like but am i doing that for them right yes exactly <clears throat> yep so i think yeah developing empathy is a very important benefit of studying history and then also i i especially appreciate that history is very interdisciplinary you know, anytime, pretty much any subject in history that you're studying or any era or event, you're going to have to learn about the economics and mm -hmm. politics and philosophy and religion and art and science. Um, and I love that about history, that mm -hmm. it's what makes it hard in some ways because yes. you're being pushed into areas that aren't your natural inclination or interest. I mean, everything I know about agriculture is probably from <laughs> studying I've done yeah. in history. Well, that's how I feel as a homeschool mom, trying to put together a history curriculum. You can't ignore those other things. Mm -hmm. They're not peripheral. They are central to what you're talking about. And so coming up with a U.S. history plan, for instance, I can't ignore all these other mm -hmm. things, the cultural influences and the, the habitats and how that is what determined what we ate or how we built shelters. You know, it's all very central and you can't do one without the other. Well, like when you did the California mm -hmm. history, I'm sure you studied the poppy yeah. and, you know, all these other flowers and stuff because in the ecology of California. We did. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fine to pursue and you know what your natural or your kids natural interests are but it's inevitable you're going to be pushed yes. into areas uh, where you're uncomfortable and i think that's a healthy thing um, and so i appreciate that just because it it develops well-rounded learners um, so yeah that interdisciplinary aspect is i think really helpful as well and i feel like just piggybacking on that now it occurred to me <laughs> that the pers then you have a better perspective about things. It's almost like you're the third person observer. Like yeah. you can zoom out of a situation a little mm -hmm. bit better and you can see the workings of the different thought patterns and ideas um, at work, even in today. Like, mm -hmm. oh, this person was brought up from this area of the country and you can still see that remnant in this discussion that we're having. You yeah. know, when we moved to St. Louis, you can... The discussions mm -hmm. and the race relations were completely different. Right. And had I known a little bit more of the history, I wouldn't have been dropping my jaw so much, actually, in some of the discussions. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's a great revelation. 
I don't know that I could have put that into words, but it makes sense because I think Mandy and I both over the course of the last few years, we kind of ditched doing certain things as separate from our history curriculums. Mm -hmm. And now we see how really the history curriculum or the era we wish to study drives the rest of the subjects we're interested in, except for maybe math, but Mm -hmm. everything else seems really central to what I'm studying and now I don't feel a need to find something separate and I couldn't have put that into words until you said that. I think historians have a tendency to act like history is just the queen of all disciplines. Everyone feels that about their discipline. I don't mean to put it that way. As an economist, (laughs) I don't feel that way. No, I would say history is important. I mean, almost any subject you want to study, including economics, Mm -hmm. how do you do that without getting into history as well? Right. So that's that's just inherent with the linear, uh, the linear nature of of the order of things. (laughs) Right. Well, I I like that what you said about being a responsible citizen, too, because when I hear I don't know much about history and politics, I I kind of ignore most of it, especially when I'm talking, you know, I I know (laughs) If if it involves scrapbooking or. Huh? Or homeschooling, <laughs> you know, uh, planners. I'm there, but uh, but when I hear a certain politician is constitutional, it inspires me to actually know the Constitution. Right. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like oh, do I want someone that that votes according to Constitution and not by party? Right. And and how would I know unless I know the Constitution? And if mm-hmm. does that take precedence over what a certain party? and how a certain party votes. Mm-hmm. And history would do that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you could go on, do at least a, one episode of podcast answering this question. One other thing that came to mind today, so at the, the school where I work, we had our first day of classes, graduate school opening convocation. And so the president was speaking and he was talking about, uh, about one's identity, mm-hmm. self-identity. And he was talking about, you know, with teenagers and early 20s are very much in the process of figuring that out. What is my identity? And I started tuning him out. (laughs) And I started thinking how, you know, the default, I mean, just human nature, the default is going to be, well, they'll define that or their first frame of reference is going to be the culture in which they live and the online culture and entertainment, right? One of the great things is about history is if you're learning about all these other cultures that I mean, like historical you know, cultures, including our own in the past, the way they live, that when they learn that uh, children they didn't have the same expectations always that they do today or families were not always exactly the same as they are today, um, they'll start to realize that certain aspects of today's culture Uh, is actually the anomaly, is the outlier. And they'll be able to identify that and say, well, wait, no, that's actually not the norm. And so I don't need to try to step in line with that because what's happening here in this part of today's culture, that's actually the weird thing in the, in the long span of things. Mm And so, um, I I'm supposed to idea. get married when I'm 13 and start having children. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> or, you know, it, yeah, there no, are I weird mean, things all throughout history. Right. Well, and, and being able to zoom out and yeah. see that. Right. Yeah. So you're, I mean, you know, one of the big um, teen crises of the day is like the, the gender identity and that kind of thing. You know, that's all over social media. Mm-hmm. And it's obviously however you fall on that, that's it's something that. Uh, teens are, are having to mm-hmm. grapple with or at least right. be confronted with and mm-hmm. think about and and some would argue there's some social contagion with that sure uh, but if, if students of history will know that well that's actually a pretty unique very very recent thing and so well I don't have to define my identity by that necessarily right. like this is this timestamp where we are right now is actually the uh, again the anomaly, um, historically speaking. So I like that aspect of it as well. Is that mm-hmm. it, it helps teens just have that broader con- concept um, yeah. and broader con- context for just working out their own identity. I mean, that's kind of the ultimate question at that age, mm-hmm. right? Like, right. what am I doing here? Who am right. I? Who am I going to be? And they yeah. already feel so like everything is so big in their lives. Yeah. You know, everything yeah. is so. <sighs> So 
tough when it happens. Yeah. You know, it's the hardest yeah. thing they've ever done mm-hmm. because yeah. their lives are so small. Yeah. And yeah. so if you can just help them remember, you know, that. Yep. Well, today exactly. I cried in our homeschooling mm-hmm. because I'm. Uh, we were learning about mm-hmm. the history of It Is Well With My Soul. Okay. The and, hymn. Yeah. and the hymn. And I was reading the history of Horatio who... Uh, stayed back because the great fire in Chicago had happened and he sent his wife and four surviving daughters to basically a Christian conference in Europe. And then the four daughters die. They perish. And then when he, he gets cabled by his wife and is told that. And then when he travels there, I'm going to try not to cry right now. (laughs) When he, when he travels there where the boat crashed into this other vessel the captain tells him, this is about where your children died. That's when he started thinking of the lyrics for It Is Well With My Soul. Wow. And, and so I'm, t- I'm reading this because I have this great book um, about the history of hymns. And it's one page of him and one page of story per hymn. And I was reading this to the, the kids. And I'm crying. And they're kind of smiling, feeling kind of awkward about the whole thing. <laughs> right. But it's to show, I said, and he still said, whatever my lot it is well with my soul. Right. So anything we go through, like that just helps you zoom out, helps you have the perspective, like knowing that history. Now, when you sing that song, you can think of that when you're going through something hard, like, you know, that words aren't empty. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can get through this. It is well with your soul. God has a plan and a purpose. And you can see that even in this, this, um, hymn writer. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, well, there are other questions. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> Talk done. forever on that. Yeah. So for those families who have a Christian perspective, and you may have already touched on this, but I just want to pull this out. <clears throat> for those families who have a Christian perspective, why and how should they teach history? Right. Well, I th- as Christians, history is central to the Christian faith. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a, a Russian who came to the United States and became an Ivy League uh, history professor uh, George Filoski, and he uh, had a great line. He said, Christians are by vocation historians. And that's what he was saying is just, history is just, it, it's at the root of Christianity. And you, you only have to look at the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, um, to see that. You know, mm-hmm. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, mm-hmm. was crucified, died, was buried, descended into hell, ascended into heaven. You know, what's the common thread there? It's all past tense verbs, right? Mm -hmm. History, the foundation of of Christianity is based on historical claims. If those historical claims aren't true, then there is no Christianity. Christianity is wrong, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's incorrect. So whether we want to be or not, Christians by vocation are inherently historians because our entire faith rests on these historical claims. I mean, the Bible is like all history. Sure. I mean, there's yep. different reasons for different books, right? But in essence, it's the story of the history of God's re- redeeming people. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you talk to people. We were, I was talking to an agnostic uh, last year, and he was saying, you know, religion camp. He said, there are all these different religions, and I think it all boils down to, you know, they're all trying to teach you how to be a better person. So my thing is, I feel like as long as you're trying to be a better person, you're good. And it's like, well, that's fine. You feel that way. There's some truth into that, certainly. But what does that have to do with the historical claims of Christianity? What does that have to do with, did Jesus ra- raise from the dead? Like, was the tomb empty? You know, yeah. that's, that's these historical claims are, are at the root of Christianity. So uh, that's one reason for sure that Christians should be interested in history. I think also Christianity teaches us that the entire human story is worthy of of our attention and that's Mm -hmm. because christianity teaches that everyone has an inherent dignity and we have that dignity because we were all created in the image of god and so you know whether this is a king or a president or uh you know some peasant somewhere or a slave that person has just as much dignity as the other because they were made just as much in the image of god as the other one. And so I love that aspect um, about history as well from a Christian perspective and kind of I related love that to about that. Christianity. There's yeah, no, no exactly. class <clears throat> system, right? I mean, it's democratizing, right? Yeah. yeah. There is no, no slave nor free, you know, Jew nor Gentile. Exactly. 
Um, and kind of related to that is this idea that in Christianity, God is not just the creator, but he's also the sustainer. He, he is involved in his creation. I mean, he is the, the son of God entered into his own creation and became part of the history. Um, and so through his providential care, he upholds his creation. He is involved in, in history. And so studying history, you know, we talk about revelation and Christian theology as you can divide it into uh, special revelation and general revelation. Special revelation <clears throat> is God directly revealing himself through a burning bush mm -hmm. or through Jesus or through the Bible. General re revelation typically we think of as as nature, as creation. We can look outside if it was light out and see the beautiful trees and, and the hills and um, you know learn about the power of God as creator, about the beauty of, of, of his, um, his artistry. Um, so we can learn things about God through natural revelation. I think history is part of natural revelation as well because general. Um, of, of general revelation things as well because we're studying the way that God has worked throughout history. And we have to be careful. We can't always totally understand why God was doing something or allowing something to happen in history. But I think there are things we can learn in that way. And I think also as Christians... Um, you know, we need to study history because it teaches us humility and and charity. Um, uh, G.K. Chesterton had a great quote that I like to um, quote to my students when talking about this. And that is, he, he talks about, he was talking about tradition, but I use it for history. He talks about um, the democracy of the dead. Mm -hmm. And this is the idea that we should be humble enough to acknowledge that we don't have it all figured out just because we're living right now. He called it the... Uh, you should not be ruled by the, the, the tiny oligarchy of those who happen to be walking the earth right now, yeah. right? What a silly thought. That's such arrogance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this democracy of the dead that we can learn from those who came before us just as much as we can learn sometimes even more from people who are sitting right next to us right now. And C.S. Lewis had a great uh, line about it. He said, uh, studying history or the reading of old books is what he was talking about. Uh, it helps us to, uh, to avoid the... Um, uh, the, uh, what was it? The, um, oh, chronological snobbery. Mm. It is the, it, the same idea of this mm -hmm. arrogance that just because we happen to be alive the latest right now, um, that we have it all figured out. And Lewis talks about, you know, it's it, people from different cultures and different time periods. They're, you're, they're all, they have shared blind spots. Some of their blind spots are going to be shared because they're all part, all part of the same time or the same culture. And he said, two heads are better than one when you're reading history or old books, um, not because either is infallible, but because they're unlikely to go wrong in the same direction because they probably don't have the same blind spots. Uh -huh. So that's just a simple humility that should draw us to studying history. And then also charity. I think it helped develop charity because when we're studying and sometimes critiquing our historical subjects or historical actors, or even just other people's historical arguments, we can practice charity in doing that. Hmm. When I was doing my uh, my master's thesis, I one of my the main guy I was writing about was someone I with whom I disagreed quite strongly, and so I was worried going into my research that uh, I wasn't going to be charitable to this guy because sure. I had strong opinions. So. <laughs> It's kind of ridiculous, but I, I found an illustration of him because it was back in the 1840s where, when he lived. And I blew up eight and a half by 11, and we had our own study carols in the library at the seminary. And I, I posted his picture there at my study carol so that anytime I was doing my research or writing, I could look up and remember that this, this isn't just a name on a page. Mm -hmm. These aren't just ideas floating in a crowd. This was a person who was made in the image of God, who has dignity and deserves charity. And, and he was a fellow Christian as well, so a brother in Christ as well. So my fellow students thought <laughs> that was very strange. Like, Are you going to offer food to that little right, idol or hold something? Hold on a second. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I think Christians should be drawn to history for that reason as well. I love it. I love it. Okay. All right. Our next section is what we should know about history. Since you've spent over a decade or 
maybe up to two decades. Don't give it up. I'm not quite yeah. that old. <laughs> Learning history, <laughs> developing history, curriculum for all ages, and teaching history in the college arena and graduate school. And what are some fundamental principles that us homeschooling parents need to know about history? whether it's ideas or thought patterns or principles that someone with your expertise could teach us. Yeah. Yeah. I think probably the, the first thing is just understanding the difference between history and the past, the past. So when we think of the past, we can think of what happened. Think of like the facts of what happened. Right. And the facts can be really boring. Yeah. They're important because those are the facts. It's what happened. It's, it's historians. It's what you're trying to get at and tell sure. the story of that, right? But it could be really, it may, reminds me of uh, it was Ben Stein's character in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You know, he asks a question, mm-hmm. anyone, anyone, ask another right. anonymous question, anyone, anyone. That Those are the kind of boring history teachers that, um, that no one likes. <laughs> but history is a discipline. History is you know, the art of reconstructing the past, of discovering the past, of uh, finding and analyzing sources, which is fun. I mean, you feel like an archaeologist, you know, trying to find those sources. Um, And then it's reconstructing a narrative and trying to tell as as with as much accuracy as possible, uh, a compelling story of what actually happened and why. And so, you know, we let's we shouldn't be focused just on the past and hit and facts. <clears throat> we should focus on doing history and finding and telling those compelling stories. So I think that's probably the first thing. I think the second thing you just have to say is, you know, like science and evidence and data, history has to derive from sources. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's you know that is our Bible, so to speak. Um, it, is, it has to be based on the sources. You can't just make things up. And it seems like something most, that should be taken for granted, but it's not necessarily um, these days. So history always has to, to be based on and come from the sources, right? The third thing I think that parents need to keep in mind when studying history is that there's no golden age in history. And sometimes people can talk about history in that way. And it depends on who's talking for when they'll identify. Some people would say now is the golden age in history if they like the way things are right now. Some would point back to the 1950s Mm -hmm. uh, or whatever era um, of their preference and point to that as the golden age. But the problem with that is it turns history into a story of heroes and villains. And that's just not reality. That's just not, that's not the way people are. That's not the way the world is. So... There's no golden age in history. Today, things are better in some ways than they were in other times, and they're worse in some ways than other times. Mm-hmm. Obviously, some of that is subjective. Um, and the flip side of that coin is that, you know, things aren't just getting worse and they're as bad as they've ever been in any given thing. What, what, it's so frustrating anytime there, as a historian, anytime there's election year because <laughs> everyone go to the very last election, which was contentious, I'll, I'll yeah, acknowledge for sure. Way. But I don't know how many times I heard pundits saying this is the most contentious election in American history from which the, the country will never recover. I had a friend of mine who loves American history and he keep, kept asking me, do you think we're going to be in a civil war? And, you know, it, basically those people on TV are saying, I don't know much about American political history because you look at election of 1800, mm-hmm. uh, 1824, 1876, 19... I mean, there were a lot of extremely contentious uh, elections in American history. 2000. Um, Jim Weiss calls them ele- electoral apocalypses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the moment, it feels like it. Yeah, we're like those teenagers, right? Yeah. Where it just seems so big and and we're so emotional. But <laughs> so, yeah, so there's no, there's no golden age in history. And I... I the other point uh, I think we need to appreciate as parents teaching history is we want to teach our kids to to think historically. And I love the way when I teach, uh, I, I use um, John Fia is a, a modern historian. Uh, he has a book called Why Study History. And he talks about the five C's 
of historical thinking. I think he, he does a good job with it. And so the first C is change over time. That kind of been a very fundamental level. That's what you do when you study history is you're observing change over time just because that's just the way history works. Not that it's necessarily getting better or worse, but just that it's, it's progressing from right. event to event to person to person. So uh, observing and understanding that change over time. The second C is context. We already talked about a little bit. It's understanding the setting the background, the belief systems, the cultural practices, everything that goes into that what's happening around this person or this historical event. Um, in history, the context provides the meaning. And so it is, it is, it is crucial in studying history is to understand the context. So uh, the, the next C is causality. So this is the idea of cause and effect. So you're basically, you know, events are best understood in relation to other events. An event, you know, the, the American Revolution, we'll say, um, happened. Okay, but why? Like, just out of nowhere? Well, no, you have to understand the preceding events that right. led up to that. So there's the cause and effect. Um, so causality is another important one. Um, the fourth C is contingency. It's kind of similar, but this is the idea that, that uh, human choices matter. And so it tries to, to uh, answer... I know why did people make the decisions they made and what effects did they have? You know, um, when someone decided to assassinate Archduke Ferdinand, um, it had pretty significant ramifications. World War One. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I don't think you knew that too. I did didn't. No. <laughs> okay. Most I can, people don't. Know I can that. tell your face was <laughs> just um, like he staring just knew off. Your face. Yeah. <laughs> I could have gotten away she with faked that. It. She faked it. She faked it well. Um, so it's it's observing uh, the, the, the effect of human choices um, that we make. And then the fifth one is complexity. And it may be one of my favorites. And that's just understanding and appreciating the fact that history is complex because you know, just as the, the present is complex mm -hmm. and we should expect that because people are complex, right? So you look at someone like Thomas Jefferson, you know, he was... Um, you know, he was one of the founding fathers. Uh, he was the primary author of the Declaration of Independence, and yet he was also a slaveholder. He was constantly in debt, and he almost certainly fathered uh, several children from his slave, Sally Hemings. Well, what do you do with that? Right. Well, lately, people have answered that in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Some people want to only tell the heroic side of that story of the founding fathers because they see a golden age in our history and want to only talk about the good parts of our history. Right. And there are others who want to cancel or completely um, do away with an historical figure once we learn the more messy parts of their lives or their actions. And I think both are just a travesty because, yeah. again, we are messy, complex people. We should expect our heroes and villains to be as well. The villains aren't always pure villains all the way down in every aspect of their being, right? Um, and the same with our, our heroes. They aren't heroic in every way either. And so I think we should teach a complex history, obviously appropriate to the age level um, with, with regard to what detail you share. But um, that's I, I love that aspect mm -hmm. about history is that you're you're learning that, oh yeah, these people are a lot like me. In a sense, it makes those right. heroic aspects of their of their lives more inspirational in a way yeah. because you think oh they're not just way up here on a pedestal but right. some they're ways, like us in some ways right. they're worse than me in this way yeah. at least, you know and oh i could do great things and really impact the world too and it's like you said when kids are just hearing the facts you don't relate to that mm -hmm. you don't relate to that on a human level and so adding that complexity and the human nature into the story i think is critical mm -hmm. and so it's it's great that that's like your favorite of the seas because yeah. I think it is so important. And I think as Christians, I think I would say that not only should we expect to see sin in every person's life who ever lived except for Jesus Christ, uh, but it's also a good teaching moment as well in, in reinforcing to our kids that, you know, that, um, that, yeah, these people were sinful as well in these ways. And in right. these ways, they did great things too. And that's the complexity of, of humanity. Yep. Yeah. I love that. 
All right, now let's go on to curriculum. What should we look for in curriculum that would make it a good history curriculum? It could be secular, um, and then we can talk about faith-based ones if you know. Yeah, well, I think, first of all, you two would do a much better job talking about specific curriculum, uh, even history curriculum, just because that's not as much my world. When I, I, I worked for a K through 12 educational publishing company, we didn't, our competitors weren't the ones who were creating the, the whole comprehensive set of, of curriculum. We were doing supplemental mm -hmm. uh, curriculum. So I should state that up front. But that being said, I think <laughs> homeschool parents would do well to ask themselves a few questions when considering uh, history curriculum. So the first would be, you know, do you want the curriculum to reflect any pers any particular ideology or perspective on the world? So obviously this could be religious, this could be political. Uh, maybe some parents would want there to be more of like an environmentalist bent to it or a social justice bent or whatever, you know, the parents want that, that kind of that, that lens through which they're t telling the history of the world. And maybe they don't care at all. And so that's something just to ask yourself. Because that, obviously, the flip side of that would be, are there any deal-breaker ideologies right. or perspectives of the world that are you can cross off the list right Especially away? Especially if it's a high school kid and you're not actually sitting with them and reading it to them. Mm -hmm. You might not know how their mind is evolving and changing in accordance with this curriculum you've given them. If you haven't asked that question, what is the bent? Right. Because what I'm, are the biases? Yeah, I'm guessing mm -hmm. most history curriculum has some kind of biases that it's communicating. Of Inherently, of course, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And th th that reminds me, that's a good point, because <laughs> even even if, let's we'll say, for, for our perspective, from a Christian perspective, if we want okay, a Christian perspective a telling of, of world history, hopefully they'll do it honestly and based on the sources and not twist things. But just because it's a Christian curriculum doesn't mean that you're going to agree with everything that they're saying. And so sometimes in some ways, um, you know, I think about if our kids went to a school, in a lot of ways I would want them to go to a Christian school, but in some ways it would make me a little nervous because, well, I know what they're being taught in a public school and I know what to what address. What the bent is, yeah. But with a Christian school, sometimes you don't know exactly uh, what things that you're not that you wouldn't agree with that they're teaching them. Mm -hmm. So that's something to keep in mind as well. It, just because it's coming from your own perspective doesn't mean it's going to be, you know, a perfect curriculum that you can just not give a close read and just set them, you know, to go read on their own or, mm -hmm. or do their worksheets or what, whatever it is. So I think that's an important one. I think another question would be what kind of methodolog methodological approach do you want um, do you want to take in teaching history so what I mean by that it's a big word for you know do you want an interdisciplinary approach mm -hmm. so something like uh, where they're going through the the narrative the story the chronology of history and they're looking at you know the political the, the, the history of politics history of science of the cultures uh, art history uh, military history you know mm -hmm. all together kind of like we were talking about earlier that I don't, everyone probably doesn't want that approach, but that is one. one. Uh, another uh, example would be, you know, maybe you'd want uh, a comprehensive curriculum where it's all in one box and maybe you don't know much about history and it's very intimidating. So maybe that would appeal to you. Then uh, that may, may be something to consider. Or are you going to use supplemental materials or maybe you only use supplemental materials and you're going to fill in all the rest. And if so, what kind of supplemental materials? You know, I mentioned the the publishing company that I was with. We developed supplemental materials, and it was exciting for me because my I was in the social studies division, and so uh, I worked on primary source kits. So there were these thin box kits, and it would be you know each one would have uh, a topic like the American Revolution or the Civil War or slavery, and uh, we would have you know, like eight different primary sources and then we would have lessons helping them learn how to walk through and analyze the primary source and provide uh, the context for it. And what was cool about it was if it would be an old document, like a letter, it would be, they would print it on old weathered oh, nice. uh, paper that made you feel like you were actually, you know, holding the, the primary source. So that's just one example of, of what's out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, or do you want more of an experiential 
approach where you're doing a lot of field trips. Um, obviously, that would depend on where you live, yeah. what period you're studying, and, and your budget, certainly. So those are some, some of the questions uh, you'd want to ask yourself. But finally, I think parents should just feel free to do what you want with teaching history. I mean, I don't think there's one right or wrong way approach to it. The bottom line, you know, you want your kids to come away leaving the house with a general sense of the narrative of history, kind of the major things that happened. Um, you want them to have an idea of, of what it is to do historical thinking, to have developed some of those skills, to develop those critical thinking skills, to be able to, to read documents in a, in a deep way, in a thoughtful and analytical way. Um, but, you know, it you don't have to cover everything. You're going to have your kid is going to have gaps. Mm -hmm. I went through uh, a master's degree in history, a PhD in history, and I have more gaps than I do have filled mm -hmm. <laughs> in my in my historical knowledge. So it's inevitable that that's going to happen. You don't want the gaps to be, you know, um, the, the Roman Empire. I mean, right. you want them to understand some things at least about each era or civilization, some of the main leaders. Not that they even have to have mm -hmm. them all memorized necessarily, but just to have that general knowledge well what i've what i've learned through watching you through your educational career <clears throat> is and learned just about hu humans in general is you know we always say you don't know what you don't know but what i've seen is the more that you learn the more you realize like wow there's so much i don't know so i always right. know someone's not very well educated when they act like they know a lot of stuff. Like teenagers. And yeah, because it's <laughs> exactly. like, they oh. They do know everything. <laughs> yeah. As far as they know. It's like, oh, yeah. That's the problem. And, That's, it's, and it's, it's why it's frustrating yeah. when, when um, like an historian talks because we always have to qualify all of our answers. Like, well, I'm not, we're not totally sure about this. And, you know, when you're, when you're more ignorant on a topic, you can just you know, wax eloquent. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So the, the bottom line, you want to have, provide them with that general narrative, the main events, the main characters, um, but there are going to be gaps. So uh, just embrace that and, you know, be willing to take the deep dives when your child shows interest in a certain topic or a certain era. And, you know, it's fine if this area will be a gap for them. They'll, they can come back and learn about that later on their own and, um, you know, the, the main thing is you want them to, to have an interest in the topic and, and an appreciation for what, for, again, historical thinking in the past. Yeah. Okay. So just diving in a little bit deeper, what are some elements of history curriculums we should watch out for? And what are some of the trends you've seen happening throughout the past two decades that have affected the history educators in today's society? Right. So as far as what to watch out for, that is going to depend on the parent's perspective and, and view on the world and what their beliefs are. Um, but I think it is an important question, what kind of historical, what trends there have been in history and as a result in history curriculum, because so whatever's happening in the academy will eventually make it down to K through 12 in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. It's it's a trickle down, um, I'm sure, for any discipline. Certainly, that's the way it is for history. So I think it is helpful to understand kind of a general, they call it a historiography, a, a general trend for um, in the academy and history um, over the last like 60, 70 years. So you, what you used to have back in the 19th century, going up really into the 1960s, even into the 70s, was was modernist history. Sometimes you'll, you may have heard it referred to as Whiggish history, as in mm. like the Whigs and the Tories. Mm. And they say something's Whiggish. This is kind of what they're referring <laughs> to. Um, and this was the basic idea of that. Um, now, this is painting with, with broad strokes, mm. obviously, but um, that history, the story of history, it, it's about progression, that things are improving, things are getting better. It kind of made sense at that time why they would have had that view, right? Things are getting better, especially technologically. It's all about progress and um, it's a very optimistic approach to history. But it was also a very elitist approach to history. Yeah. Uh, it focused on uh, the leaders, the, the political leaders, religious leaders, the thought leaders, kind of the movers and shakers, the inventors. Um, it, was, it focused on, you know, typically white male wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Um, and there was... Some good reason for focusing on leaders in the sense that 
Well, it's true. Yeah, the those who are more influential in a society and a culture are going to have more influence and impact on that culture. So you certainly shouldn't ignore them. Right. Um, but it was a very much a top down method of doing history. And the, there were some certain drawbacks to that approach. Uh, it tended toward hagiography, you know, again, that kind of heroes, villains, mm. golden age kind of approach to history, um, as well as kind of a, a triumphalism that progress, progress, progress. Again, that kind of arrogance that we are the greatest generation who are all living right now. Um, and then you had a challenge to that really uh, with the civil rights movement. So starting in the 1960s into the 1970s and and it's still very much here today, and that's postmodernism. And it flipped the modernist approach to doing history. And so uh, if modernism was top down, postmodernism is very much bottom up. There's some good parts of that because it's no longer focused on just the elite or mm -hmm. just the majority, but it's also the, uh, the common folk kind of lived experiences, uh, which has brought about some really interesting historical scholarship. Um, and it's focused on more of minorities and um, kind of the joke in the, the 90s and, and 2000s was you can get a PhD uh, or a dissertation accepted as long as in your subtitle you have the, the phrase race, class, and gender in there. Mm. <laughs> so you could do like Neolithic tools, a study in race, class, and gender. You know, it didn't, right. didn't even have to have anything to do with your, your dissertation uh, topic. So... So this is postmodernist approach is very much flipping it on modernist uh, approach to history on its head. It was very much influenced by Marx and Foucault and other writers. And it wasn't as much interested in what happened because there were, they don't believe that there, there's a, a, an, a, an objective truth. Uh, so I don't know why you would want to go into history if you don't believe that there was something that actually happened. But or at least that you can't actually get at anything mm -hmm. about what actually happened, mm -hmm. any real truth to it. So, so describing and telling the story of what happened isn't as much the interest in postmodern uh, historians' approach as it is power. So narrative is about power. It's not about what actually happened. So an example of this you see in the 1619 Project, a very controversial um, uh, New York Times uh, series of articles, um, long form investigative journalism that came out. These weren't historians, although they consulted some historians, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, and it was in the headlines. Basically, you know, that made a historical argument that uh, the founding of America started in 1619 oh. uh, when, when the first slaves arrived in the New World, and it was all, you know, basically trying to tell the story of Amer American history. Uh, from the perspective of the oppression of African Americans. So um, there's certainly a lot of truth mm -hmm. to what they were saying, no doubt. I mean, I, one of my areas of focus was slavery and anti-slavery, so I appreciate a lot of, a lot of that. But they had a very postmodernist approach where it wasn't really about what actually happened and being faithful to the sources in that sense, or... They were more comfortable ignoring other sources because they didn't fit the narrative that they were creating right. because the narrative was king. Hmm. Um, the narrative of, uh, was the power. And uh, most of the top uh, living historians of, of that era um, have come out and just blasted it, including um, like James McPherson, um, Wood, uh, Sean Wallens, who is a very progressive historian. He was one of the... Um, one of the witnesses in Clinton's uh, impeachment hearing. And anyhow, so they came out, conservatives and liberal historians, and, and blasted it because it's just not good history. It's not being faithful to history. But it's, again, it's a representative of that postmodern approach where, well, it's not really as much about what happened as it is about the power of the narrative. So I think this postmodern approach, which we're still in, um, it has some helpful correctives to the modernist approach in the sense that, yeah, they make a good point that we all do have our biases, right? We can't ever be totally objective about something. Mm -hmm. And we won't ever know the full, complete story and truth about what happened in a certain event just because we don't have all the sources and we're just not going to understand every single dynamic that went into it. At the same time, them saying, you know, there's no such thing as objective truth 
um, is a deal breaker for uh, someone like me, certainly, I think a lot of us. So I would say what, you know, as for what we would want as historians would be, you know, we need to make that noble attempt to discover and tell the story of what actually happened, being as objective as we can, even understanding we're not going to be fully objective or get the whole truth. And so getting back to the curriculum part of things is, again, what happens in the academy trickles down to, uh, to the curriculum and to K through 12. Case in point, 1619 Project is now taught in many of the schools. They've they've made lesson materials for K through 12 for that project. Even so, though that's been blasted. Well, yeah, I mean, most people don't know it's been blasted because yeah. they're not, they don't, they don't know who Gordon Wood is. And know? so that's one of the reasons I wanted you on here is because I know, I remember hearing when you were doing your PhD, this underlying um, argument and debate and fight about everything. And that most of the, most people, well-educated people, don't even know is happening. And so when we're looking for history curriculum, it's like, I, I love going back to the, um, like, does it teach empathy? Does it teach mm -hmm. charity? Does it, you know, teach these other things? And are there actual objective truths in it? You know, just mm -hmm. pulling from that. But knowing that this debate and these arguments are all going on, knowing that, okay, I don't have the end all and I need to keep an open mind that my curriculum may not be as amazing as I think it is yeah. and, and right on tune with what's true. Yeah, exactly. And it's not, it's not always going to be, well, this curriculum is from my perspective, so they're going to have the perfect representation. Like, no, I mean, I'm sure the curriculum we're going through that's written from a Christian perspective I'm going to disagree with some of them and say, mm -hmm. oh, that's not actually a very good argument that they're yeah. making. Or I don't know about the sources there. You know, both sides should have that view. But right. going back to the curriculum thing, I think what's important is, um, you know, it, the publishers, curriculum publishers should have, um, they should be public about what their perspective is. Mm -hmm. So if you're a parent, again, looking into uh, researching different curriculum, uh, I think you know, you should look, they should have it posted on the website in some form of, you should know what their perspective is. Yeah. But the thing is, if they don't, I think it's totally fair that we should assume that they're writing from the, they're telling history from the perspective of uh, the spirit of the day, of, of, again, kind of that postmodernist kind of approach of what's just dominating culture right now. Because they want to sell. The they well, want to sell to the they, schools. They want to... And to be fair, I mean, they probably sincerely believe that that yeah. is, I mean, the... the well, because the professors the are teaching. And... So you think of if you're getting a degree as a teacher, you're going to the college and the college professors are teaching you what is all the rage. And then now you're becoming a teacher and you're going into the schools and then you might be consulting with publishing companies and telling them what needs to be changed and so yeah i mean it's a very direct trickle down right. right so the bottom line is for when you're looking at curriculum the default is uh it's going to be more of that postmodern kind of approach and you know some parents are totally fine with that um but you should just know that with eyes wide open going into it that unless the the publisher says something explicitly on their website that that they take this approach to, to history mm -hmm that they're probably in mm -hmm. kind of the mainstream, I yeah. guess you say, of academy. So, Just yeah. like I assume when I'm teaching creation or the origins of man, I should say, I, I know if it's not a Christian publisher or a creationist Christian publisher, um, that it's going to be evolutionary based. Sure. Yeah. yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, last part, college. So as a college and graduate school professor, how can we best prepare our homeschooled children for studying history in college? And would this differ for someone who wants to major in history um, compared to those who won't pursuing, aren't pursuing a, a history degree? History major, yeah. I don't think the preparation would actually be any different K through 12 for history majors or non-history majors outside of the interest level of the child. So I don't think you would need to worry about that. Um, but I do think there are some things to keep in mind. Again, just harp on this one more time is make peace with the fact that there will be gaps in their historical knowledge and their historical mm -hmm. education. 
and that's fine and it should be freeing it should free you up and knowing okay well i can't be perfect anyway so let's pursue you know what they want to pursue and uh, again like i said before you know the focus should be on on uh, developing their understanding of historical thinking and practicing those skills um, on on humility and empathy and charity and um, and those five C's of historical thinking and then giving them just a general uh, concept for the development of world history and you know in kind of the, the narrative timeline perspective for the major events and the, the main people and then just focus on whatever eras or topics that your child or you find interesting and you know just feel free to have those um, those deep dives and just be willing to sacrifice other other parts um, i do think as they start to get a little older i think it'd be very important uh, whether going into a history major or not to read more primary sources mm -hmm. like you were talking about earlier i think again things like uh, uncle tom's cabin or incidents life of the slave girl um, uh, Lincoln's second inaugural mm -hmm. address, King's letter from Birmingham jail. Uh, they're all American history stuff for me, of course. Um, those, it's really important for them to read the primary sources, in part for the reason you brought up earlier, um, in part also because it helps them learn how to be analytical readers. So when I was working at the publishing company, it was in 2012 and 13, so Common Core was the rage, yeah, especially yeah, in yeah. curriculum publishing world. And man, they couldn't wait to <laughs> slap those Common Core alignment stickers on those old kits that they had. Huh. Anyhow, so one of the things I was tasked with, which was a lot of fun, was getting into the research in the white papers behind Common Core. Ooh. And it was staggering to me. I read a report, a study that the average, at least at that time, um, the average American high school graduate um, had an eighth grade reading level. I mean, that is devastating. And they said the reason for that, the main reason they identified uh, was because of a lack of reading of what they called complex texts. Oh. Now, complex texts sounds like you're reading um, Kierkegaard. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, that's not really what they mean when you actually get into it. What they really mean is just uh, read, an analytically reading a text and be able to take a deep a deep read on a text doesn't even have to be primary source primary sources just lend themselves really well to it like um, like Lincoln's second inaugural because it pushes you into some language maybe you're not familiar with some references maybe you're mm -hmm. not familiar with and you have to look up and think about but you know you're you're taking a deep dive into that document and you're you're analyzing it so it's developing those critical thinking skills um, that analytical reading. So they were saying it, it's the pulling back in our curriculum of those complex texts that has led to this decline in the reading level. So I think primary sources are really helpful in that way as well because it forces them to, um, again, going back to empathy, put themselves put themselves in the shoes of yeah. you know this historical actor talking about their life during this time. Uh, and think about the context for why is this happening to them and what do they believe about the world that's the same or different than me. Um, and then I think it's also helpful as they get older to read secondary sources. This would be historians who have done research using primary sources and written like history books, basically mm -hmm. your secondary sources or articles and read some secondary sources, especially as you get into the high school level, um, who, you know, historians who present conflicting arguments or conflicting narratives and have them assess those arguments and make determinations on which one do you think, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each, which one do you think was more persuasive and why. And that really forces them to get into the logic of their arguments, get into their sources. Are they mm -hmm. valid sources, sufficient sources, good quality sources? Um, so I think that's important as well. Um, and then, you know, but the, the most important thing is all, of all of it is just to make it fun. You know, to avoid it being just these rote facts that you're reciting. It's not just one darn thing happening mm -hmm. after another um, or memorizing facts. It's it should be compelling stories because history, you know, if, people, if you like 
good film. But what do you like about it? You probably like, you know, when they have complex characters, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's fun to have mm-hmm. little cotton candy movies, as we call them, uh, if, if you don't want to think. But it's fun to have those complex characters because they're those are real. You know, they resonate with you. Uh, that's that's what the stories of history should be as well. You know, they're they're filled. These stories are you know they're inspiring, they're frustrating, they're horrifying, um, they're funny. You know, it's just the, the whole gamut of of humanity. And so, more than anything, that's what I would love to see brought through to K through twelve kids and, and learning about history. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. I feel like you need to go speak at uh, homeschool conventions. Oh, no. yes. Maybe you need to come with us. Ooh. <laughs> I'll be your cheerleaders. Well, this is probably the longest you've ever heard me listen to you talk. <laughs> I normally have fallen asleep like three minutes into him sharing anything True. with me. Especially and history. Especially history. I, I had to hold it. back all my questions. What? Wait. Oh, no. no. We'll about, talk offline. It's, yeah, it's not related. <laughs> okay. So it made okay. me think of all these other things. Yeah, because you love history. <laughs> yeah. And Marcus has actually made me love history yeah. in certain aspects because when I was at church and he taught Sunday school class for like a 14-week church history course, and he's done it at a number of different churches we've been at, that was the first time I was actually interested. And because normally like academics is not my thing. I really don't know. I don't hold on to facts at all. And so if you're listening and you're like me, take, you know, encouragement from me that I, I literally know nothing and I don't even know, <laughs> I don't know the order that things go in other than World War One and then World War II. <laughs> so, so I, I don't know any of the names that he mentioned. I don't know any of that. And I feel perfectly equipped because there's so many great resources out there. And then people like you, Marcus, I, I love hearing from you because now I know, oh, th- I need to look at the three C, I mean, the five C's. I need to look at empathy and, uh, and you know, what you were talking about earlier of why teach history and, and make sure I check those off. I have a little checklist for myself and make sure that makes it in mm-hmm. and, and that I have fun with it. Because, mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember while I was in high school, I took history at the community college mm. And I loved my history classes. Mm. I had a teacher that at least I enjoyed. And I remember thinking, man, I'm going to do so well on this test because, like, I'm loving this. Yeah. And I wouldn't pass tests. Hmm. Yeah. Because she ended up asking only factual oh. questions. Right. But yeah. I'm like, I could tell you the whole story right. about yeah. this. But you, I didn't yeah, like exactly. remember 1876 or whatever the date was. Which is a terrible way of doing assessment for oh. history because yeah. right. why does it Why does it matter? Is the most important thing that you're remembering these dates right. or someone's name? Or that you're getting really what's important out of that story, right. you know? And I could be missing more of, you know... The oh, reality totally. of yeah, how that yeah. all happened. Maybe I was missing no, more than just no. a date. You're the hero. But... <laughs> she was the villain. <laughs> but it definitely took a little bit of joy out of it because I yeah. was fascinated in these topics and then I wasn't receiving grades that made me feel like my interest was, you know, equating to academic achievement. Mm-hmm. And so that really kind of turned me off from wanting to take more college level classes in history. And so then I would just go into my reading and yeah. read books instead because that was more interesting. Well, and it's how you evaluate it. Like in my right. twos in the third right class, for example, there were all these primary letters, source letters that we read from Nazis that said, we didn't have to do anything. The villagers took the Jews, put them in the temples and set the temples on fire. Like we didn't even have to right. do it. And, and so then the question from the professor that we had to write a paper on, are people inherently evil or are they brainwashable or was it survival of the fittest? What was it? Right. Why you did me. this happen? Yeah. And you tell me. And he's like, there's no right or wrong. See? And another and, question. And that's ask. really good about that. that. That's yeah. what's interesting. That's, that's what makes history come to life and makes it fun. Even about a terrible topic like that, it made it fun to like try and figure out what do I think about this? See, oh, another question to ask in that case is, is this source a reliable oh. source? Is this, is this a, um, uh, a reliable, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Yeah, well, yeah. Is it a reliable source? Like what, in other words, like I tell my students, you need to interrogate your, your sources. Mm-hmm. Like think of it as, you know, like a detective movie and 
it's a sweaty room and there's the <laughs> hanging light over and you're interrogating because you have to ask questions like, what does this author have to gain right. by getting me to believe what they're saying? Yeah. So you're interrogating just to make sure that, so perhaps, you know, these Nazis had something to gain by washing themselves of the oh, incident. Yeah. So that's part of, yeah, any yeah. Of, just that complexity of it is yeah. just another yeah. layer of, right. oh, but is this even but, accurate? Yeah. Can yeah. Believe that? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on My with us. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. So that was really fun. So fun. Yeah. I wish I listened to my husband more. He has so much to offer. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, But um, I love getting to have so much knowledge packed into one episode. For sure. As a reference point to go back to. Okay. Now it's time for Game Game Schooling. schooling. We're going to share some more games with you. We've already covered some on history, Mm -hmm. so we won't go there again. Mm -hmm. But as part of my U.S. history study for this year, I'm starting with North America. And I found some great games that go along with the curriculums I'm using. The first to go with my Gather Round Homeschool North American Birds study is the Sibley Backyard Birds Matching Game. It's super cute. The cards are little squares, about two and a half inches by two and a half inches. Just like a memory game. Exactly. They're nice, thick cardboard, Mm -hmm. nice, thick paperboard. And so they're not easily bendable or breakable. And they have beautiful images Mm -hmm. of birds you might find in your backyard. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. And and they're not little kiddish art. No, no, it's not. The legit bird yeah it's kind of got this old retro feel to the to Mm -hmm, the images definitely and we've taken them out as we've studied the bird that might be in there so for instance the ruby throated hummingbird was the second bird in the book that you learned about and so i pulled out that card to help inspire my little one's um coloring of the ruby oh i love that Mm -hmm. so just really neat to to have that as a resource outside of it being the game yeah but as a game it's really cool just teaching the memory skills and working on that kind of stuff with my with my son most particularly who's no, who's just four. Yeah. Yeah. He's just four and a half. And yeah. These you, are the skills that we're building. And you know, um, I know in the Charlotte Mason philosophy, you want to be able to name everything. And yes. I think it's so cool. Like when we were on our road trip to Colorado and we, and we would see Tafonis mm-hmm. and I'd be like, there's a Tafonis again. Right. And it, for some reason you attach to things so much more when you know its name. Right. And so I love that you can use these memory cards, not just to play a game. Yeah match the pictures but to learn the names right well you know what's really fascinating is after we studied the ruby-throated hummingbird he realized that the hummingbird we bought as a souvenir from the san juan capistrano mission oh, field trip yeah. we did together remember, yeah he remembered that that was a ruby-throated hummingbird oh. and we actually call that guy picaflor because that is the spanish word for hummingbird and in his music class last semester we sang a song about Pika Floor. Oh, that's cute. So it was just a really cute way to tie that all in. Had nothing to do specifically with the game, but mm-hmm. just more ways to reinforce learning. And then when he saw the picture of the barn owl on the game cards, he thought that was such a weird looking owl as compared to, say, like the great horned owl. Hmm. It looks so different. Its face is almost kind of spooky looking. It kind of looks like the Harry Potter owl. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, it actually looks a little bit like Voldemort. Oh, um, you know, yeah, so it's got totally. this kind of weird look on his face, just yeah. the way his face is kind of the feathers are colored and stuff. And so it inspired him to ask to look at more images of the barn that. owl. And yeah. I know we're going to cover the owls later in our study. Uh-huh. So I didn't, I refrained from doing too much, but why not show him some yeah, images? Yeah, he attaches mm-hmm. to it. And then we actually studied the American Robin today. And oh. so that was just really cute. And so now it's just reinforcing the names of those things. I he can it. identify them outside and come back so it's a really neat game for that it's really sweet and and simple to look at you know how smart you sound when you know the names of birds you're mm-hmm. like oh there's the great blue heron and mm-hmm. um there's the red-bellied woodpecker yeah. versus just i think there's a woodpecker it's like right. oh, it's the red-bellied woodpecker Specific. <laughs> yeah. yeah i love that and then my husband actually picked this game which we have not yet played it's called wingspan and it is it's gotten all the highest ratings yeah you know five stars for over eight thousand ratings yeah 
and it is a bird collection engine building game for one to five players. It says it's for ages 14 and up, so we probably won't have my little guy play it unless he wants to be on my team. Um, it has a ton of pieces, and so we haven't even broken apart all the pieces yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. I have no idea how to play it, but my husband was super excited about getting this game. Well, it says it has 75 egg miniatures. Right. So that's really cute. You know, it's on sale right now, so we linked it mm -hmm. in our show notes, but it's normally $65, yeah. but it's on sale for $40. So yes. I would definitely check it out now, and, you, and you'll find it right in our show notes. Perfect. And then the final game that I have is actually a game we've had for a long time that is definitely children approved. My kids play it with your kids, yeah, and they, they all love it. love it. And we yeah. only know that they're playing it because... The first part of the game is to howl for dominance, uh -huh. and whoever howls the loud loudest goes first. So it's quite competitive. They have to pick one person to be the judge, and then everyone just howls. So and cute. I think it's devolved to somebody just screams as loud as they can, because that's the loudest. So what's it called? Alpha. Yeah. It's called the Alpha, and it's all about wolves, and it's teaches a lot about their hunting practices, the types of prey that they'd go after, the consequences for going mm. after certain types of prey. Um, it requires more energy to go after big prey, and so you might have to sacrifice more, but the payoff is bigger. Yeah. So it's a strategy game, and there's a lot of risk and reward involved. That's awesome. So it's designed for ages 10 and up, although younger kids can certainly enjoy it and play it. But I think that um, it's because it's a strategy game, I think the older kids definitely get into it more. But and you said it's light on strategy, though. So that's why upper elementary can play. They call it a like light a strategy game. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So because the gameplay is pretty short, it's not. it doesn't go on going for too okay. long. There's bigger games it's like Catan like or Ticket to Ride. Okay. Those strategy games are long play, mm -hmm. and so there's a lot more going on, and what you do now has a bigger consequence. But this game is a little more short play. Cool. I don't remember how long the the average game is, but it's relatively short, which yeah. makes it a game I like to play. Yeah. I don't like to sit at the table for very long. Mm -hmm. So Alpha is also mom-approved. This yeah. is a game I would play. So. Those are my, my yeah. three games for you. And they're linked on our show notes. And right yes. now, Alpha is oh, 50% yeah. off, normally $30, and it's mm -hmm. $15 linked for that price. Because there's other yes. versions that cost more, but mm -hmm. this one's on our show notes. So check yeah. it out. Thanks for listening. We love your support. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, leave a rating and review to let us know how we're doing, and share our podcast with your friends who need a little community, humility, and joyful fun in homeschooling.